we're ready to start now on this topic. Um, just, I, I told Angelo not to say much about my background because I'm just going to give my own personal story here very briefly before we get into the material. Uh, I grew up in a small church in Burlington, Ontario, and uh, was the only one my age. I was the youth department. <laughs> I was the youth department. And I had a brother and two sisters younger than me, and, and they were, you know, they're the other youth in the church. Just our family, that was it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, everything is simple and clear when you are in a small church and you're told what's true and what's not true. And I, I think I knew quite a lot when I went to university. Uh, once I got there, though, I, I realized I didn't know much at all. Do you know what a sophomore is, by the way? What's a sophomore? Second year, right? Do you know what it means? Well, it comes from a Greek word, two Greek words. Uh, Sophia comes as what? It means wise and wisdom. Okay. And what's the moron part? <laughs> okay, it means a wise fool. Someone who knows just enough to be dangerous, enough to think they know something they don't. And I went to there with some friends of mine who are from other churches, Adventists, and they went and they hit the secular campus of McMaster University. All three of my friends left their faith. They were unprepared for the challenges of a secular campus, what it would do to their faith. They were faced with questions they could not answer about their faith. That's why I'm involved in campus ministries now, because I was severely shaken in my faith when I hit the university campus, campus university. I had been hanging out with Christian friends in a Christian little church, you know, the Sabbath school lessons, did those every week, you know, and I was not prepared for brilliant men telling me that my faith was nonsense. It's time to grow up now, here in university. Put away your childish ideas. That's what I was told by a professor of religious studies, who is now a professor of Hinduism, who had been an Anglican minister, and had abandoned his Christian faith, and now was teaching Hinduism as an academic subject. Not that he was Hindu, okay? But it was just fascinated him, and so he studied it and he presented it. But he himself had given up his childish ideas about the Bible and faith. Now, this is the issue here. Do, when, as Christians, do we have to leave our brains at the door? Do, can we be academic, reasonable, rational individuals and yet believe the claims of Scripture? Yes. Well, I hope the answer for you is yes. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here in this room today. But, but I meet people who are Christians who say, you know what? If you believe in Jesus, if you love God, then it doesn't matter about all this other stuff. Reason, logic, history. They're unimportant. Why confuse yourself with these things? Don't worry about such things. Just hold on to your faith in Jesus, and the rest is just simply confusing to you, right? How does the hymn go? You ask me how I know he lives. He lives where? In my heart, right? And for many people, that's enough. The other things that, the other questions that people ask are not even questions to them. Now, that always confused me because they were always questions to me. And when I faced the questions on a secular campus, I realized I needed real answers. It wasn't enough simply to say, well, I believe it. Well, why do I believe it? Is it true? True because it is true, or because I want it to be true, because my mommy told me, or because it's actually supportable by the evidence. Okay. Now, many people who believe in different faiths believe it because they know it's true in their hearts. If you talk to a Mormon, what do they say? Does anybody know? Pardon? Burning in their heart, an inner testimony. They say that we accept we accept the Mormon faith because. We know it's true. We have this inner testimony burning in our hearts that tells us it is true. How do you argue about that? Hearts deceitful. Yeah, hearts deceitful. Okay, well, maybe the heart's not enough then, right? Now, or you talk to someone who's charismatic. They'll tell you that their gift is real because it's a real experience to them. How do you, how do you discuss that with them? If it's a matter of your experiences versus somebody else's experience, on what grounds do you actually derive, arrive at what's true or what's not true? Experience versus experience, right? I've talked to people who are spiritualists. They know that the dead are still living because they've talked to them. Okay? Is experience enough to know what's true? I don't think so. 
What does Jesus say? Worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy strength. The whole person is involved in the love of God and the worship of God. And that means much more than simply an experience. If someone say, what's more experience? What's more important? Your personal experience or your rational understanding? I'll simply say, which wing of an airplane is more important? The left or the right? Okay. You need both. In balance together. Okay, to have a healthy faith that can handle the doubts and the questions that come your way. And as Christians, if you want to share that faith with someone else, you better be able to understand and answer the questions on their ground. Not on, you can't simply say, well, I believe in so, so it must be true. They'll say, well, that's nice for you to pat you on the head and go their way. Okay? Um, I was just talking to Angela before, the, before we began this afternoon. And, um, you know, as a child, well... 14, 15 years old, I would go to evangelistic crusades, as we used to call them then. Don't call them anymore, because that's not politically correct. But used to go to these meetings, and they would have, uh, what would happen? They would tell you what the Bible really teaches about the Sabbath, the state of the dead, and so forth. And those meetings were always directed at other Christians, people who already accepted as their basic worldview, the Bible is the Word of God. And when your audience thinks that, we've got an easy job of it. We can show them that this is what the Bible truly teaches. And we're going to tell you more truth than you knew before. And you know what? You may have missed this and this and this. And they'll say, wow, that's amazing. So we put out our flyers with colorful beasts of Daniel and so forth. And uh, people come out to hear our lectures. And they're amazed at what the Bible says. Now, that's the way it used to be. And so you put out these flyers, thousands of flyers, and hundreds of people would come. Guess what's been happening in the Adventist church? when we use this method, at least in North America, okay, in the last generation, the numbers have been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Why? A lot of people are not Christians. Our audience is different. We're not speaking to the same culture anymore, the same audience anymore. People are much more secular in their thinking. The, the society at large is much less Christian than it was. And so we have to, and this is, you know, certainly the the case on a secular campus. We can't start by saying the Bible says that you should worship God on the seventh day Sabbath. They'll say, so? Okay, the Bible says you should worship on the seventh day. Fine. Who cares? Okay. Why should I care about the Bible? Is it true or is it not true? I don't know. It may be true for you, but not for me, right? Okay. So I think that if we're going to be effective sharing our faith, as a disciple of Christ, in a modern culture, we have to understand what's going on up here in people's minds so we can meet them where they were. Okay? Certainly this is the way it happened in the New Testament as they did evangelism. Now, this is a very silly thing I did. I came without my Bible. I left in the church where I preached this morning. But I know the text and I'll point you to them and you can look them up for me, okay? Is it necessary to know the reasons why we believe what we believe? Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, we would be here dealing with something called apologetics. Okay? What is apologetics? Who can give me a good definition other than Angela here? Okay. What is it? Sorry. Okay, apologetics. It's nothing to do with apologizing for anything. Okay? What is apologetics? It's an ancient discipline, I say ancient, from the earliest days of the church, on giving a reason for the faith that is in you. Okay? Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a defense. Why you believe. Now, let me tell you a verse that actually uses the word. Okay? 1 Peter 3.15. If anyone doesn't cover this verse with you, he will. If he hasn't already. Okay? Or you were away that day, or you're sleeping after a big lunch. Okay? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15.